Bugatti has done it again. Just when you thought the combustion engine had peaked, with all future development shifting towards electrification, Bugatti announces a V16 engine. Yes, that is what it sounds like, and it's something we haven't seen in production cars in over 80 years. Bugatti was mad enough to develop a W16, putting it inside the only 16-cylinder production passenger cars of the 21st century, and they're still at it with a new V16 on the way. While confirmed specs are scarce, there's actually a lot we can learn from released images. So we'll dive into all the V16 details, but to truly understand this engine, we need to back up and understand how we got here, starting with the unique masterpiece that is Bugatti Veyron's W16 engine. So it all starts with the Bugatti Veyron, which had an 8.0 liter W16 engine. Essentially, this was two VR8s at a 90 degree angle, with these VR8s having a 15 degree angle between each cylinder bank. So we have quad turbochargers, and in the most potent version going in the Veyron Supersport, this was making 1200 metric horsepower, 6400 RPM, 1500 newton meters of torque from 3 to 5000 RPM with a red line of 6500 RPM. The big advantages here, tons of power, huge engine, very unique, quad turbo, double VR8 design, We're of going into an elite level of supercar. Now it's not exactly accurate to describe this engine style as compact, but putting 16 cylinders in this configuration versus say a V16 actually is pretty compact as far as the dimensions and the size of this engine. All right, so as we go from the Veyron to the Chiron, how did this W16 evolve? And a lot of the specs look the same, right? It's still an eight liter W16. You still have those two VR8s at a 90 degree V and you still have quad turbochargers. But you'll notice it's a lot more power, 1600 metric horsepower and 1600 newton meters of torque. So more torque as well and a slightly higher red line. So how were they able to make so much more power? Well, the big change came with the turbochargers. Two changes here. First of all, the turbos were 69% larger. Nice. The second thing that they did is they now are using sequential turbos. So instead of each group of four cylinders having its own turbocharger like you see here on the Veyron, now you have a shared exhaust manifold for each cylinder bank. And so what they're doing here is using sequential turbos. So at low RPM, all eight cylinders are dumping into one turbocharger. When you get to higher RPM, you open up this valve here and then you're using both turbochargers to create boost at that higher RPM. And you blend this as you accelerate from a low RPM to a higher RPM, slowly opening that valve and then using both turbochargers to maintain that boost. This gives you better response on the low end, better torque on the low end, and then still allows you to have that massive top end by using both turbochargers. So if you look at the torque curves, it's really interesting what they did here because if you look at the previous with the Bugatti Veyron, you can see it's a fairly narrow section of peak torque, just about 2000 RPM for peak torque there. We're using this sequential turbocharger strategy, you widen that so much so you have so much more useful torque on the low end and more useful torque on the high end, more than doubling that range of peak torque. So if you were only to use the two turbochargers at a larger size, yes, you'd get more torque early on in that earlier lower RPM range, but that torque would fall off as you got into that higher RPM and those two turbochargers became restrictive. So then you switch over to this four turbo design, which yes, if you only use four turbos like you did previously, but they were larger, well, you'd have less torque on that bottom end following this dotted line right here before you reach that higher end. So you blend both of those, eliminating those downsides using sequential turbos to have that huge flat torque curve. Okay, so if you look at the progression from Veyron to Chiron, the performance goals were to not only increase the torque, but to widen the torque curve, meaning not only more power, but a more useful range of power. Keep those goals in mind as we progress to the next evolution with the V16. 
All right, so let's dive into the V16. Now the history of the V16 as far as production cars is very short. It all starts with the Cadillac V16. Yes, named so because it had a V16, which was around in the 1930s. Now this had a 45 degree angle for that V, and you might wonder why use a 45 degree angle? Well, you want to split up all of your power strokes between the cylinders evenly. So if you wanna calculate your firing interval, you look at the number of strokes this engine has, four stroke engine, multiply that by 180 degrees. So for every power stroke, you have 720 degrees of crankshaft rotation, and you divide that by your number of cylinders. So that gives you 720 divided by 16, 45 degrees. In other words, you have a cylinder firing every 45 degrees of crankshaft rotation. Why is that important to the design of that V? Well, when one of those pistons, which are sharing a common crank pin, is at top dead center. As that crankshaft rotates 45 more degrees, the piston it's aligned with on the other side is then going to be at top dead center. So you can use both of those in order to have that 45 degree separation with your firing interval. So Cadillac is essentially using two inline eight cylinders at a 45 degree angle, but were I to characterize Bugatti's V16, I'd say it's more like two V8s connected together with the banks at a 90 degree angle. So how did I get there? Well, looking at the new engine, you'll notice there are number labels for each of the cylinders. Now, if you have an engineering degree and an advanced understanding of mathematics, such as myself, you'll notice that three is not the number that comes after one. And not to brag, but I also noticed that 11 doesn't come after one either. Usually, the number two does, which is all the way down here. So, either Bugatti has a really hard time counting or these numbers represent something else entirely, like the V16's firing order. Okay, so how does this firing order tell us that it's a 90 degree V? Well, you can see that one and three are across from each other, which means you're gonna have one cylinder fire, then 45 degrees of crankshaft rotation, another cylinder fires, then 45 degrees of crankshaft rotation, and this cylinder fires, meaning you have 90 degrees of crankshaft rotation between these two cylinders, which share a common crank. Now, if that is the same pin that they are sharing that isn't split, that means you have a 90 degree V. Okay, the next thing that stood out with the numbers on the engine is that all of the odd numbers were on one side, whereas all of the even numbers were on the other side, which means it alternates firing from one side to the other side. Odd side, even side, odd side, even side. So we've got our odd side labeled A, our even side labeled B. And in splitting this up and creating these two separate V8s, we're going to discover that they're two cross-plane V8s. All right, this is a little tedious to understand. However, what we're doing is very simple. We've got our two lines of cylinders, we've split them in half, we're labeling them one through four, five through eight, one through four, five through eight, and for each of these, we're then going to recreate the firing order as if it was just a V8 engine. Okay, so for our V16 engine, one correlates with one of our first V8 engine. Then number two correlates with six of our B V8 engine. Then three correlates with five on our A V8 engine. And then four correlates with three on our B V8 engine. So you can see as you do this for all of the firing orders for each of these two V8s, you get each of these firing orders for the individual V8s. Now what does that tell us? Well, with a cross-plane V8, you tend to fire the outside cylinders, then the inside cylinders. Here's a simple visual showing what that looks like. So again, you've got the outside cylinders firing, then the inner four cylinders firing, then the outer four, then the inner four. On a flat plane crankshaft, you see it alternate between two cylinders on the outside, two cylinders on the inside, two cylinders on the outside, two cylinders on the inside. So here you can look at these firing orders and see that two and three and six and seven are all grouped here together, meaning it's going inside, outside, inside, outside. Same with B. Six and three, seven and two are inner ones, all grouped together. So it's going inside, outside, inside, outside, as far as the firing order. So that tells us that this is a cross-plane V8. Now again, looking at these numbers, you might say, wait a minute, why is this firing order different from this firing order? And actually, it's just mirrored V8s in order to balance things out. So if you look at, for example, going from five to four, okay, we're drawing an arrow from five to four, then we go from eight to seven, eight to seven, then we go from two to six, 
we draw an arrow from two to six, then an arrow from three to one. So we draw that arrow from three to one. If you do the same thing on this one, you're going from three to seven. All right, there's that arrow three to seven. And you can see these perfectly mirror, all of these arrows uh, perfectly mirror each other. So you're balancing things out and you're alternating. When this one is firing the outside cylinders, this one is firing the inside cylinders. When this one's firing the outside cylinders, this one is firing the inside cylinders. So they reverse things, they mirror it, everything balances out and it's a nice and happy V6. Engine. Okay, there's one more critical detail to understand in order for all of this to work out. So if we're going from odd on this side to even on this side and alternating back and forth each time, that means we have 45 degrees of crankshaft rotation between this one and this one. So in order for that to work out, it means this crankshaft has to be offset 45 degrees from this crankshaft. So if you were to look at it down from the side, you'd see a cross for one of the crankshafts, A there, and then in order for that fire it over to work out where it goes back and forth, you then have a 45 degree switch and that cross plane crankshaft for the other V8 engine. All right, time to come clean. Mate Rimac, the CEO of Bugatti, actually posted some photos of a prototype engine on Facebook. So we have a few images we can analyze. First, we can see the crankshaft. And since two cylinders share a common crank pin, we can confirm based on the firing order that it is a 90 degree V8. And you can see it's clearly a cross plane crankshaft, which halfway through has a 45 degree offset, creating the two V8s which alternate power strokes every 45 degrees of crank rotation. Oh, and there's a photo of the engine block, where you can eyeball 90 degrees pretty easily. So was all of this a waste of time since those photos exist? Maybe. Moving on, it's important to understand that all Bugatti has informed us of thus far is that it's a V16 engine and it's part of a hybrid powertrain. Those are the only two things confirmed. Reportedly, however, there have been private customer presentations where more information has been divulged. Allegedly, it's a Cosworth developed 8.3 liter naturally aspirated V16 revving to 9,000 RPM and producing 1,000 horsepower. All right, I don't really care about speculation. I'd rather just learn the numbers from Bugatti directly when they choose to reveal them. However, that doesn't mean we can't do a little bit of math and just see if these reported numbers actually make any logical sense. So a way to compare them using another Cosworth naturally aspirated engine out there is the one that goes in the Gordon Murray T50. It's a 4.0 liter V12 revs to 12,100 RPM, 654 horsepower, making that peak power at about 11,500 RPM. So let's imagine these numbers are accurate. Our Bugatti is probably gonna make peak power, you know, 500 RPM or so lower than the red line. So let's say 8,500 RPM. It's going to then be making 1,000 horsepower divided by 8.3, or about 120 horsepower per liter. Now that's much less than the T50. The T50 though is revving higher. So it's not really a great way of measuring them side by side because they rev to different RPM. So what's a better way of doing this? Well, looking at brake mean effective pressure. Uh, a simpler way of doing that is just looking at torque per liter. So this, the Gordon Murray T50 4.0 liter Cosworth V12 engine is making 299 pound-feet of torque at its peak horsepower number, so at 11,500 RPM. We can calculate the same for the Bugatti if it were making 1,000 horsepower, and that would be 618 pound-feet of torque at 8,500 RPM. Okay, so now what is our torque per liter at that peak horsepower number? So for our Gordon Murray T50, that number is 74.7 pound-feet per liter. And for our Bugatti, again, we're trying to find something close to say, all right, is this realistic? The number ends up being 74.4 four pound feet per liter. Okay, so these numbers are extremely close to one another. So the numbers are feasible, and as far as speculation goes, I am inclined to believe that it's going to be naturally aspirated for several reasons. Number one, the power numbers make sense for it to be naturally aspirated. That's one indication we're on the right path. Number two, looking at the intake manifolds, there aren't intercoolers visible, and the manifolds, while shared, have split throttles between the two sets of V8s. 
If it were turbocharged, you'd likely expect to see a more simplistic manifold style connecting all eight cylinders of each bank, much like you see on the turbocharged W16 engine from the Chiron. Number three, it sounds like a high revving naturally aspirated engine, but that's generally difficult to objectively confirm. And number four, when asked about it in a Facebook post, Mate Rimac said, translated to English, you are good in response to hoping the engine is 1000 horsepower naturally aspirated. You'll also notice this is in response to having 1000 electric horsepower. So reportedly the setup has two electric motors in the front, you've got a 24.8 kilowatt hour battery, in the back you've got your V16 engine paired with another electric motor, each of those electric motors at 250 kilowatts or combined rating of 1000 horsepower. So you've got your 1000 horsepower V16, you've got 1000 horsepower from electric motors, combined peak of around 1800 horsepower, uh, and for the rear sending that power through an 8 speed dual clutch transmission. Okay, so the big question, why go with this V16 hybrid strategy? Well, it does make a lot of sense when you think about combining Rimac and Bugatti. So the CEO of Bugatti, uh, also the CEO of Rimac, combining their two strengths, electric and combustion, into one all-out performance vehicle, and also just having a really unique experience, right? That's what Bugatti is about. So, you know, while a V16 is large and heavy, and it's going to be complicated and expensive, these are things that really don't matter to the Bugatti buyer, right? And if you start to look at, okay, what was the evolution of the Veyron to the Chiron? Well, they tried to push out that torque curve, right? They wanted to have more available torque across a wider RPM range. And what does electrification do for you? Well, you can raise that performance even more and you can have it start at zero. So you can have the ultimate torque curve here. Instead of, you know, suffering on that low end with combustion engines, you fill all of that with the electric motors and then as you get into those higher RPM, you use that insane V16 engine to provide the torque on the higher end. And you have a much more beautiful torque curve, uh, even though this one already was quite good. So really impressive. Looking forward to seeing more details about this vehicle. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them below. Thanks for watching.